Well, hello. It is time for yet another, uh, you know, native flute lesson. And I love these things. I actually love doing these. I think they're really fun. Uh, granted, it's, you know, it's only 30 minutes and it's not as good as one-on-one, -on -one, but we do what we can to try to get as many people out there trying to play as possible because it's it's good. People need to, you know, practice and need to play something, need to be inspired by something. And hopefully I can help uh, motivate you and get you excited about playing the flute, uh, even if there are just these tiny little lessons and tiny little snippets. I would love to be able to take every one of you one on one and work with you uh, individually and try to figure out all the different problems you know you may have and try to fix them and solve them and get you to be playing better. But unfortunately, that type of thing isn't possible. So uh, we're just gonna listen to let me. You know, you're just gonna have to let me talk to you and hopefully you gain a little bit of understanding, a little bit of insight, and uh, have a little bit of fun as we do it. Now, uh, this is, you know, we've, we've been doing this for a little while now. This is our sixth lesson, which is uh, six. I actually think this is our seventh lesson. So our seventh lesson. And uh, with our seventh lesson, you know, it's it's cool. If you have been following along and actually listening to each one of the lessons, uh, you should have a pretty good understanding now of how the flute one works and two, how you can kind of put it together to make your own music. And that's what you are looking for. We want you to play your own stuff because playing your own music is awesome compared to playing someone else's music, which even though that's really cool and that's really fun and that's something that we all should do, uh, it's really great to be able to start creating your own. So uh, hopefully you are have been following along, and if you have been, you'll know where we are in terms of what the lessons have done and where we are kind of moving in this world of music. So uh, let's jump back a couple lessons. I always like to review at least two lessons back. That way you can have an understanding of where we are and where we come from, but also kind of quickly understand and review in your head all these different things that we have been doing so that you can go, oh yeah, I remember doing that. I remember doing that. So we always try to recap at least two lessons. Uh, two lessons back, always a little faster. Last lesson, we're going to always take a little bit more time to review just a little bit more stuff and then kind of keep moving forward. Uh, I'm going to drink a little bit of water real quick just because I like to have water in here. So excuse me for one moment. Okay. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, two weeks back. Like, What did we talk about two weeks ago? Well, uh, a couple weeks back, uh, what we ended up talking about is we ended up talking about the idea of creating more patterns for yourself as you understand how the flute works. So we talked about rhythm a lot, and we have this idea of a pulse. I'm just saying my metronome going. Um, we have this idea of a pulse and this beat. We put context to the beat by including the idea of notes like whole notes and half notes and quarter notes. But as we take this rhythmic context understanding, as we're moving forward with this rhythmic understanding, the idea here is to be able to start to create patterns that we can practice with so that we can create a great melody that people will want to listen to. And that's important. As we're playing music, it's important for people to, or it's important for us to understand that our audience has kind of an understanding of what they want to hear. One of the big things that audience members want to hear is they want to hear consistency. And that's important. It's consistency. It's not necessarily just, you know, the rhythm or the, you know, this note pulse or anything like that, but they want it to be a consistent and fluid idea for them. One of the big things that heals, well, I guess one of the big things that kind of creates consistency or holds the audience to consistency is the idea of the pulse and having that pulse internalized and that you're able to play with that pulse. Now, not every song out there has a pulse. There are some very, you know, avant-garde and 20th century compositions and modern day compositions that are very much, you know, pulse free and you can do whatever you want to. The problem with that is it's really difficult for audience members to kind of hold on to. Pulses can change. And that's really something that we haven't really talked about. The idea of playing around with a pulse and creating a different type of subdivision or a different type of context in order for people to understand. We haven't really talked about that. Maybe we'll talk about that in a future lesson. But the idea here right now is just this pulse. One, two, three, four. We talked about rhythmic context and rhythmic context being like, here's a whole note and then here's a half note and then here's a quarter note. I'm understanding that those pulses can break in halves and that we can play around with those halves. And that's a kind of a really big deal to hold on to and understand. We want to listen to this pulse. We want to get that rhythm. And then we want to be able to play with it. So we just start off by playing, you know, the, the scale of our lower hand. So, you know, first position, 
second, third, fourth, fourth, third, or yeah, third, second, first, right? We can't play with the positions in our hand. And we create this kind of pattern that we can play with. One, two, three, four. Very simple, very easy, but it gets us kind of into that context, into that rhythmic understanding, and into that kind of hearing that beat and allowing us to play around with that beat so that, I mean, seriously, it's it's so that those people who are consuming our music can understand it and hold on to it. And, and, and really, it's trying to get our people that we're performing for to appreciate what it is that we're doing. You can play for yourself, and that's wonderful, but when you play for other people, you really have to kind of think about them, and that's going to allow you to connect with them and have this really kind of cool synergistic idea of performer and audience, performer and audience, which is what musicians love to get into. All that with the pulse. Right, so we create patterns to be able to do that. The ascending and descending pattern now is one we saw. We also did alternating patterns the idea of the one to three to two to four to four to two to three to one. We have that type of pattern. And the nice thing about patterns that jump or skip or you know, move over notes is that you're able to get into that uh, understanding of here's where that note sounds solid instead of here's where it kind of shivers or quakes, right? So if I'm playing uh, like my three to one pattern, so three to one, and I don't hit my one properly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to whistle or it's going to blow over blow and it's going to quiver. And you don't really want that, right? You don't want this. You actually want it to be very solid. So this is where this type of practicing and repeating really, really helps, right? getting that solid sound and that's where the jumps come into play and that's where that pattern comes into play and that's important creating your own patterns creating your own ways to practice and understand the instrument for you is vitally important this is a you instrument right this is a personal instrument it's not a me instrument it's not about what i can do it's about what you can do and even though i play a certain way you're going to play a certain way and your way is just as important as the way i play you don't want to mimic each other because that kind of takes the fun out of experimenting and growing your own persona with the instrument. You want to play your own stuff. So that means you have to find your beat. You have to find your pattern. You have to find your way of landing on the notes. I can instruct you on how to do stuff, but it's up to you to try to fill in that gap so that you understand it and internalize it and make it your own. And that's the importance of creating beats. We're creating patterns that go along with beats. I'm going to stop this real quick. Then last week, we ended up talking about the upper hand of the flute, which is, or the last lesson, we ended up talking about the upper hand of the flute, which is great because we, we've, we've been focusing so much attention on the lower hand, which is important. We want to get this down strong, but now we have are, are adding our upper hand, right? And so our lower hand, we do have this first position, second position, third position, fourth position, which is all the fingers off. And then we have now new positions fifth position and sixth position remembering we keep this finger right here anchored onto this hole this is important because that is the anchor finger it is our if you go up you know it's our fourth finger here or our first finger on the upper hand i like using the numbers four four five and six it just makes it easier no matter what you're playing. Instead of having to say, for, you know, first finger, lower hand, first finger, upper hand, and I can just say fourth finger and we kind of understand where we're at. But different people have different techniques and how they kind of talk about the fingers and how they talk about the positions. And so I just want to make sure that we can, can understand each context if we're going to you know, say these type of ideas. So um, it's this finger right here. 
the fourth finger is our anchor finger. And it's a finger that just stays there. It just anchors on that note and it never moves. Now, eventually we will move it. We will actually introduce new tones or new notes. But for the time being, we talked about that anchor finger always staying there. And what this creates is a very natural minor pentatonic scale that we can play up and down. Ready? One, two, ready, go. And that is the full minor pentatonic scale that you can play on the Native American flute. And is a very simple scale, right? And then we also talked about that minor pentatonic scale also has letter names and how those letter names attach to the upper hand of the flute as well as the lower hand of the flute, right? So letter names first, right? So we have this, which is the name of the flute, whatever the flute is. So this is my B flute. And being my B flute, this is the B note, okay? Now, remember, we go up the alphabet, but we skip the next letter. So this is B. We're going to now skip whatever the next letter is and get to D, which is now going to move to E, which is now going to move to F sharp. Again, don't worry about the accidentals. I'll walk you through it. Just know that it's an F of some sort. And this is an F sharp. Okay, so we're going to go B, D, E, F sharp. Now we're going to skip over the next one so we can get to this note right here. And we skip over that, right? We're going to skip over F. We're going to skip over G. Now we're going to get to A. And then we come back to B. Because the top note, our sixth position, the one that's here, is actually going to be the same note as our lowers, as when we have it all filled in. This note and this note are the exact same. They're just an octave apart. They're just higher sounding and lower sounding, right? So here we go. Here's the all filled in. They're just an octave apart, but they're the exact same note, just higher, right? That's really the idea. And we want to get that used to us. We want to understand that that is part of the importance of this new upper hand note values. That we do have that octave in there. And we do have these two additional notes that kind of fill out the gaps of the entire pentatonic scale. Now that we have that, we can create melodies like that. But we ended up, we ended last lesson with the idea that I kind of want to extend a little bit further this lesson. And that's the idea of creating patterns that we can play with, right? We have now a beat, and I want that beat to be there, okay? And we're going to call this beat quarter notes. That's the rhythmic context we're going to put. These are quarter notes, which means if I want to play half the beat, if I want to play faster, I can split the notes up and do what's called eighth notes, right? That's when a quarter note splits in half, and all of a sudden we get eighth notes. And those eighth notes will sound something like this. So now we can have these eighth notes inside of our beat. I'm going to turn the volume just a little bit. So now we have that kind of faster pattern. With our standard beat still being that click, very simple, very slow. And now I'm just adding eighth notes into that kind of mix. I'm going to put the eighth notes just a little bit a little softer. So we have that core beat with the eighth notes there. Now, what I want to do is I want to play quarter notes going up and then play eighth notes coming down. So we're going to go slower going up and then we're going to go faster coming down. And we're just going to play up and down the scale. Ready? One, two, ready, go.
See how that works? Now I have a pattern that's quarter notes going up and eighth notes coming down. Now I can understand how that faster patterns can work into our fingers. Again, one, two, ready, go. Pretty easy, but once you start playing it, you'll see that it's not as simple as it sounds. It's a little bit more complicated to get your fingers to move that fast, as well as get a good solid sound out of the notes. Because when you start playing around with jumps and skips and playing faster, you, your fingers can have a tendency of actually not hitting the note, but maybe hitting slightly on the note or partially covering the tone. And if that's the case, you're going to get a sound like this. Or you may want to sound like this. So learning how to play fast is really good, but it's also important and vitally important to learn that as you're playing fast, you still want to keep your fingers solid on the holes so that you get a really good sound. It's, two, I mean, the two most important things about the flute playing is the breath and the fingers, making sure those fingers create a good solid seal on the holes, okay? So having your good breath and the fingers. And we've talked about breath control before, the idea of, you know, breathing in, holding, and then breathing out for long counts. So let's say, and let's see how long we can go, right? So we're gonna breathe in for four, and then we're just gonna hold for two, and then we're gonna go breathe out. One, two, ready, go. Now hold, now breathe. I'll keep a 12. That's, 12 is a good one. But the idea here is just to kind of get your breath going and getting it ready so that when you're playing, it's actually active and it's actually moving and helping you push notes out that are clear and solid sounding is really what we're looking for. We're wanting a solid sound, right? Two. So we're going to go, like, I'm going to play my pattern again. We're going to go up and down fast. And we're just going to keep that kind of breath control going and everything happening to make it so it sounds really good. One, two, ready, go. Now, I could just do that twice in a row and see what happens. See if I keep going with that good breath control. One, two, ready, go. It's getting a balance of, of what you can breathe and how you can practice and how you can create these exercises for you. That's really important. Now, let's do a slight variation on what I just did. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play up quarter notes on the first four notes. So one, two, three, four. Then I'm going to play half notes. One, two, three, four. Then I'm going to play eighth notes going down. Ready? And then go just right here. One and two and three and four. So it's going to be four quarter notes, two half notes, and then eighth notes. And we're just going to see how that pattern works. Ready? One, two, ready, go. All of a sudden now, I'm creating this variation of how the sounds and notes and rhythm all works and allows me to maybe utilize that in my own performances. Maybe I like that sound, right? All of a 
of a sudden it creates kind of a pretty melody, even though we're just using like rhythm and, rhythm and our scales to kind of create this pattern for us to play in. But we could use that in our own performances, right? Um, let's try another pattern. And we're just going to use quarter notes this time, but the quarter notes are going to allow us to go alternating. So we're going to go first position, third, second position, fourth, third position, fifth, fifth, whoops, sixth position, uh, fourth position, six. And uh, let me say that again because I messed that one up really bad. So let me just try that again. Ready? So first, third, second, fourth, third, fifth, fourth, six. We're going to do quarter notes going up. And then we're going to see if we can remember eighth notes going down using that same alternating pattern. Okay. So six, four, five, three, four, two, three, one. That's the idea. Okay. We're going to see what happens. One, two, ready, go. <laughs> I actually played that wrong, didn't I? I didn't do my alternating going up. I just went straight up. Okay, let's try that again. I made a mistake. Just like everyone else does, I make mistakes too. Uh, one, two, ready, go. You see, I even made a mistake in the end of that. So the idea is it's not, you know, just practicing it over and over again will help you build up endurance, build up memory, muscle memory, and also make you so you don't make these mistakes as, like, I'm making mistakes. And that's fine. Uh, everyone makes mistakes. You don't have to be perfect. But the idea here is to kind of just create something that allows you to practice and allows you to grow and allows you to overcome these mistakes when they happen, right? Now, you may be noticing something as I'm playing here. It may be the how I'm connecting certain notes together and how I'm not connecting other notes, okay? This is what in the world of music we call phrasing, how notes can be bound together. They can be melodically connected, right? Fluidity of notes where it's just a da-da-da-da-da-da, where it's just all lined together, that is a phrase. We'll call that a phrase. Um when we start separating notes, it's not that the phrase is maybe shorter. It's just that we break it up a little bit differently, right? And if you think about phrases in terms of, um, well, just think, think about in terms of communication, right? If I'm talking to you, I'm going to say something that's hopefully smart and intelligent and in one sentence that you can understand. Maybe through emphasis, I break up the sentence but it's still kind of a concept that allows you to go, oh, well, that's how one thought works. That's kind of the idea of phrasing. In phrasing, we can connect them or we can kind of break them up if we need to. Phrasing is really nice when you have passages that connect the notes over and over again because people really like that. It's very um, smooth. It's very nice and sounding. And so we can have phrases that sound like this. which is a nice fluid line connected phrase. But I can also break that phrase up. And that is also kind of the same type of idea. It's a still, still the same phrase, but it's broken up into disconnected sections. I want to still be connected over a couple notes, but maybe add a little bit of space and maybe give a brief. Sometimes broken phrases become more interesting more so the connected phrases. And so as you're practicing going up and down, maybe take a time or take a moment to, to break one of these ideas into maybe separate phrases. For instance, if we do that quarter note, half note, eighth note thing, that one little exercise we create, maybe create the phrase like this, right? One, two, ready, go.
all of a sudden now it becomes a little bit more interesting, right? Try this one. The concept here is these sections, these breaks, these other types of, you know, stops inside there make things a little bit more interesting to listen to, more so than just things connected over and over again. Connection is great, don't get me wrong, and that's fluidity, and that's kind of connective tissue, and people really like that, and it's a great sound. But phrasing, adding a space here or there, adding the idea that these notes may not be always connected is a really cool thing. Maybe next week what we should do is we should talk about the idea of attacks and releases so that we can maybe understand understand this concept of phrasing a little bit better. I think that might be a good thought to do is look at attacks and releases because how you attack a note, how you start the note and how you end the note allows you to create these types of cool phrases, which is something that we should, we, we should definitely look into. So um, let's do some just real quick recap of everything over again of what we talked about. Now, I know this is kind of a, a continuation of what we did last time, but this is really important. The idea of creating patterns that work for you, that allow you to build up your skills and build up your uh, creative creative muscles, right? And also allows your fingers to get used to what's going on and create these solid sounds on our flute. That's really what's so important. So even though, you know, two weeks ago we talked about rhythm and trying to keep that rhythm and creating a context, and then last week we talked about creating new notes or adding the new notes of the upper hand, it is still connecting to this whole tissue of let's make sure that we are looking at the rhythmic context and creating exercises that allow us to continue down this road and down this train of thought. These things are so vitally important. I really can't stress enough how important it is for you to create patterns that you can play around with, right? I love the alternating patterns, but maybe think about jumping up, maybe do first position to fourth position, the first position, the fourth position, the first, fourth, second, Third, try that pattern, right? That's one, right? Try first to sixth to fifth, or I'm sorry, first to sixth to fourth to fifth to third, right? That's a neat little pattern when you listen to it. First to sixth to fourth to fifth to third. Okay, right? Again. That's a neat sounding pattern. Now you include that in some of your stuff, right? Let's play a scale going up. All I'm doing is moving up and down the scale. I'm just using different patterns and different jumps to get to these different notes. The thing here is creating that kind of rhythmic idea, that kind of repeatable phrase, a repeatable sentence that allows people to go, oh, I like that melody. I like that idea. I like that concept. And you can make mistakes all day long as you're playing. And that's fantastic. As long as you create that mistake into kind of a repeatable idea, people will never know it's a mistake, right? So maybe you wanted to do something like... Well, I'm gonna mistake. Okay, so I made a mistake, but I can now make that mistake into a pattern, and that allows me to create more things, and people really enjoy that type of stuff. Remember, long tones are what people want. 
showing these short type patterns that people are exciting for people to hear, but we always want to end on long tone so that people get what they you know came to listen to for the flute. So uh, that's what we're going to end on today. It's just kind of creating more patterns, creating more ideas, kind of giving this kind of connective tissue a little concept, um, the idea of phrasing just a tiny bit. And then we'll, we'll start talking about attacks and, and, and releases and how that works and everything as we move forward into our next couple lessons that are coming up. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for coming in. Keep playing the flute. Keep practicing the flute. It is a great and a wonderful instrument, and I can't say enough about it because I love it to death. It's such a fantastic instrument, and I will see you next time.